Good morning. Is that coming through? We do want to start the day on an error. Um, in fact, error proneness. I love the fact that water is so close to so much electronics. What's the best place to put this? You can be custodian of the water. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about is the errors that we make in software and some of their consequences. Now, obviously, as this, as I'm speaking at CERN, then um, in honor of being at CERN, Comic Sans. If you don't know the reference, go Google it, Comic Sans CERN. I mean, how else do you announce the discovery of a new fundamental particle, but with overloaded slides in Comic Sans? You know, that's, uh, uh, yeah, quite memorable. They did, the, um, they did the black hole picture, the Event Horizon Telescope, a little bit better, I felt, you know, so that's a bit of one up and shit. So for the next, for the next thing, CERN really needs to either go crazy on the fonts or just much more austere. Now, things I've done, things I, I like kind of photography of books, and my name's on those, so I guess that means I know something about software architecture, and my name's on this, um, which means I've edited a bunch of stuff, because I think uh, developers, so our collective intelligence is, can be far better than our individual intelligence, and collectively gathering this knowledge together is, is a good thing. I'm currently in the process of doing 97 things every Java programmer should know, kind of, we're going to start that, but watch, if you think you have something to contribute, um, please be in touch. Uh, however, a lot more people seem to know me for something else. Error screens. Now, this, is, this started as a kind of like a personal hobby. Um, this is 2006, this is Madrid Airport, Terminal 1. It's quite a big message. I had to take two photographs. <laughs> and what is interesting about this is that what we see when software fails is we are given insight into its internal structure. It's at that moment that all encapsulation breaks. Software is essentially the art of creating, software development is the art of creating an illusion. Okay? Here I have a universal computing device but it can act as an alarm clock. It can act as a um, chess-playing device. It can act as all kinds of things. We create illusions. And at that moment, you're drawn into the illusion when it works. But when it breaks, it fractures along fault lines, um, like aircraft wings, um, like physical uh, items. You can actually tell where the stress was and what it's made of, more importantly. And this is made of DOS. This is actually a, so this is 2006, this is actually a, um, a TCP IP stack. Um, you can tell it's not, you can tell it's not Windows because Windows only uses the word kernel in one, one of its error messages. And this is not that error message. For a number of years I thought this might be a Linux distro, but somebody actually did a perfect match on the exact, um, uh, error message and found they thought it was Windows 3.1, but actually it is DOS. Um, and it is a TCP IP stack that uses this exact one. So this is 2006, DOS. Um, DOS has, in theory, been dead for a while. These days, DOS is, we think of DOS as being denial of service, and that's actually historically not, a, not inaccurate. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, but, but this is if you know stuff. Everybody else is going through immigration going, Whoa, five free packets, where can I claim them? <laughs> Humans operate off this, very, we have very simple pattern matching. We don't care. You said free. I, you had me at free. I don't care what it is. I want it. So, uh, but I also take screenshots. You can tell how far back this one is. This is Mozilla. Um, so, pre-Firefox. Um, this is the Dutch rail website, NS. Uh, it's about 2007. And... If you hadn't already guessed, because it turns out that when people are told about encapsulation, what they do is they say, yeah, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put private in front of some of my fields. But you know what? I'm going to publish a URL that tells you exactly what the technology is. It's just like, no, really. The, the, the web is littered with .jsps, .asps, um, .phps, .whatever. It's just like you don't have to show the technology. Encapsulation means encapsulation. Preserve that illusion. But if you hadn't already guessed... It turns out that when you're looking for an earlier train, there was no earlier train. There was only java.lang.null pointer exception. There's kind of like a, there's some kind of existential message here. I'm not entirely sure what it is. You look into the void and it stares straight back at you saying, no ticket for you. But what is interesting about this is that it makes us start thinking not simply about the technology, but about the world around how this was created. Because 
you probably want to give the user a message. And you want to give it in Dutch or you want to give it in English, but you don't want to give it in Java. That, that one is wrong, okay? <laughs> so how did this escape the server all the way out to the client? Normally we say, well, you know, it, surely there's a big out to try. Maybe this is a kind of a standard practice that you should say, whatever happens, we do not show this crap to the user. But apparently that's not a practice that's used amongst the developers. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't have time. Maybe they didn't test. Maybe, well, this is kind of interesting, but what is more interesting is when I use this two years later at a conference in Amsterdam, I got a big laugh, and then somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you know they still have that error. <laughs> so there are two things we can take away from this. One, this was a known error amongst random people in the Netherlands. And it's a case of like, so in other words, this is widespread. Two years later. So that starts raising questions about what kind of development culture has been encouraged there. Okay? And this is probably not to do with the developers. This is probably to do with the environment. And this is, this is, this raises deeper questions. Again, I don't have answers directly, except that I do know that they redeveloped the whole website from scratch the year after. I don't have answers, but this is the point. Most of the interesting things come from questions. We need better questions. It also turns out that as developers, we are the, this is 2009 as well, we are the greatest creators of uh, guerrilla installation art on the planet. You know, our, our work in software allows us to do this kind of stuff. It's got this beautiful matrix-like quality. This is Copenhagen Airport. Disappointingly, on the route back, it was replaced by an advertisement for perfume, which is far more mundane. Now, this, uh, it's got to the point where people start just sending me this stuff on Twitter. And then, about two years ago, was this fateful one. Arriving in Bologna, I saw a Kevlin Henny screen. Oh, I have become vocabulary. You're never safe from a Kevlin Henny. You're, you're at a safe, I believe this is safe distance. It has got to the point where I got mentioned in the register, just before Christmas. Da, 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 da. Made three Kevin Hennies at Waterloo Station. Footnote, Kevin Henney is a humiliating public software failure. Photographed <laughs> and tweeted to the eponymous account. <laughs> Kevin Hennies are frequently seen at ATM machines and supermarket checkouts, but the best ones usually occur at transport hubs where they enjoy the full benefit of giant displays. <laughs> and just before Christmas also, I found, somebody pointed out, you are now in Urban Dictionary. Now, <laughs> Now, honestly, I use Urban Dictionary to figure out what my kids are saying most of the time, but now it's just like, okay. Um, about the best thing about this one is like, get a Kevin Henny mug. I pointed, <laughs> I pointed this out to my wife and she kind of looked at me knowing and said, it's okay, I've got one. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of got out of hand. A couple of years ago, we did this at, um, this is Agile in the City, Bristol, 2016. The organizer, John Clapham, said, quick, there's a Kevin Henney downstairs, and what I want to do is take a photograph of you in front of it, and then I will tweet it, then you will retweet it. It's like, whoa, okay, mind being blown. So the following year, we did it again. <laughs> and then at Devternity, we ended up with this one. Now, now, what you see, there's an interesting one here, is that you know that thing people always tell you, as you get older, you shrink. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, however, yesterday, I was presented with a fresh opportunity. Wonderful tour of the CMS. Thank you, Yup. <laughs> Kevin Henney taking a picture of a Kevin Henney at LHC. at CERN. Does that count as a meta Kevin Henney? Okay, mind completely blown at this point. So, here we are at CERN. So, what else can we say? What does the outside world think of all this kind of stuff? Well, they're kind of worried about, you know, production of black holes, accidental time travel. We have that in software. We do time travel. Not too sure if I'm traveling, but, uh, time traveling, but pretty sure there is no minus 1 a.m. or minus 1 p.m. It turns out that we are deeply confounded by time, but I've got this one. It's okay. We are deeply confounded by time, and time is one of the areas that we end up with so many accidental... And these are tri often trivial errors. People are often like, oh, what about the big picture of the application? But these things start occurring all over the place. So here, I can take you back to 1969. Well, this is pretty cool. I've got a time machine. Yeah? Now, 
you know, so your feedback will be used to improve, improve Facebook. This is a verifiable proposition that has been falsified. But look at the date. 31st of December 1969. What's significant about that? Yeah, it's, the, it's, it's just before the beginning of time, which is quite cool. 1st of January, 1970. But what happened here? So clearly, wait a minute, if I get a zero, that's going to take me back to then. But then if I do a time zone adjustment somewhere further west, that gives me this. So that's where this one came from. And it turns out these little forgot to initialize things Errors, these little overflows, underflows, and so on, quite popular. In 2013, I thought that I was going to get basically a semi-infinite license. <laughs> Sadly, that turned out not to be the case in the long run, but again, a falsifiable statement. Um, but what is interesting here is as developers, you're immediately looking at that. You can't see that as a random number. For non for non-developers, they see many of the numbers that, that happen. You know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen blog postings uh, from journalists going, well, this number seems to be 255, which seems pretty arbitrary. And everybody else is going, everybody in developers, no, no, that's, t- that's 2 to the 8 minus 1. It's not arbitrary at all. You know? In other words, you have this kind of matching. You go, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's 32-bit signed integer. You can't help yourself. You're just doing it. But this is a point here. We have, we struggle with these ideas. And we have this illusion as well that the, Stuff that we're dealing with it follows um, certain laws. Well, that was exciting. Um, <laughs> follows certain laws, but it doesn't. It turns out that the, basically all your integers are very badly behaved. It's actually some, one of the cases where the word int is not inaccurate because it certainly is not an integer. And then you have floating point numbers which kind of like float around. They are seriously badly behaved integers. And we can also tell the technology. Because, man, but it is not a number. That's a profound statement. It's also a true one. But what, it, what, we, what we're seeing here is, oh, okay, this is probably JavaScript. Now, JavaScript's not the only thing that deals with a NAN. NAN is part of the IEEE 754 representation. It just happens that it's surprisingly popular in the JavaScript space. NAN turns out to be really popular. In fact, let's go back to the Dutch Rail website. Please note this email is not a valid ticket. Actually, it's not a valid order confirmation either. Order number, null. Oh, okay, we must be dealing, this is an existential thing. We are looking once again to the absence of an object. And there are statements that we can make about that that are deep and profound. And uh, Nietzsche would be proud, but perhaps we shouldn't be. But it, this stuff, this, these oversights, these things turn up all over the place. And this was, um, uh, we have uh, some nice examples of this going back just over 20 years. Uh, you know, Microsoft continues the Trump, uh, Trump the success of its NT operating system over Unix-based systems. U.S. Navy is having second thoughts. The USS Yorktown was paralyzed, ditched in the water because of an NT error. In fact, it was a low-level error. It was so basically a device driver. It was defined by zero. You know, I had my my 17-year-old son come through uh, to me the other day. And he just uh, he's, so he's studying maths at school, and he said, Dad, I've just watched a whole video on the problem of division by zero. Do you know about this? <laughs> How long have you got, son? <laughs> but it turns out it has real consequences. Okay? These are oversights. These are very simple oversights. They have, you know, if we're talking about NT, this is quite a popular one. Uh, <laughs> you know... Okay, but I, you know, a lot of people go, ah, ha, ha, yes, right, but we're not affected by that in the Java world and stuff like that. Yeah, sure you are. You know. What I like is that from a security point of view, this is kind of like a case of sometimes you can look at a failure and you are given a beautiful reading of the whole technology stack. And you can tell all kinds of things about it. You know, it says, this is great. You know, here we've got, you know, apparently it, what's great, and this was sent to me, apparently what's great is that in Canada, Deliveries, it's trilingual. Okay? English, French, and PHP. And we can see the address model. It's a fairly, not very exciting object model. Um, but I'd be concerned about that. But now, a lot of these are quite fun. They're quite amusing. They're very personal. They occur to you within the context of a browser. They occur to you within the context of an app. 
But occasionally, they start raising bigger questions. I mean, this is kind of an interesting one. Again, it's a philosophical conundrum. Okay, so if I'm not allowed to pay for anything over zero pounds, then what is the purpose of this application? Okay, and you know, it's just, it's a kind of, it's a, all of these are also a reminder that in many ways, software development can be considered a form of applied philosophy. You are creating thought structures. You are creating models and interpretations of the world. And you can create them in a way that is sheer fantasy. In fact, there's a beautiful crossover between the worlds of software and fiction. Um, and you can create worlds which are sheer fantasy um, that provoke deeper questions about the nature of being and society. This one is an interesting one. What are we saying about capitalism here? Okay. But sometimes these escape the personal bound context of your interaction with the world. Sometimes this kind of thing gets a little bit bigger. So what we have here is night capital. So on the 1st of August 2012, night capital yeah, kind of went out of business. Night capital Group realized a 460 million US dollar loss in 45 minutes. That's $10 million a minute. Honestly, I wish somebody would give me that kind of trust. I could, I could say, I can do you the same for only $1 million a minute, okay? I am a much better investment than these guys. <laughs> and what, so there was a, so what is interesting, this is a really good write-up um, from 2014, uh, Doug Seven, he's talking about it from a, a DevOps perspective. And what we see is that there was a change in, uh, so it's 1st of August, there was a, a change um, in basically the data that was being circulated. There was, you know, a new feed or something was coming online at New York Stock Exchange. Um, everybody was um, given due notice of this, plenty of time to plan for it. Um, so on, uh, so you know, Knight Capital up, upgraded its uh, software. Um, or did it? So the system that they updated, the update to Smiles was intended to replace old, unused code referred to as PowerPeg, a functionality that Knight hadn't used in eight years. Ooh, dead code. The problem is the code that was updated repurposed an old flag that was used to activate PowerPeg functionality. This is the idea that this often happens. I, I, I've done this. I know many people have done this. Where you have either a message format and you have, you're thinking, how do I... How do I update the message format without changing the overall schema, particularly header lengths and things like that? How do I do this? Well, either we had some bits that were unused, so now we're going to purpose those to be used, or we've got some old bits that are unused. We will repurpose those, and basically the overall binary format or even the textual uh, representation remains stable. Brilliant. Genius. Let us recycle. We live in an era of recycling. This is a good ethos. There is only one problem. You better make sure that the things that are dead are also buried. I've watched enough paranormal and zombie movies to know that this is, remember I said there's a crossover between software and fiction? Believe it. Because what they discovered was the zombie apocalypse. When the dead came back to haunt them at $10 million a minute. Now, what is interesting here, and what I find fascinating, is that Doug Seven's treatment is actually really good, except for one thing. Why code that had been dead for eight years was still present in the code base is a mystery, but that's not the point. Oh, but it is. Because a lot of these things occur not because of one thing or another, but because of one thing and another. They are the perfect storm. They are at the intersection. That code had been dead for eight years and had been utterly benign in one sense. A sleeper cell, if you like. But it took small perturbation to do that. If that small perturbation had not happened then they'd still be trading, okay? The point here is that is important. It's these interactions. That's what makes a system complex. It's these interactions. So DevOps, it's not about the dev or the ops. It's about the DevOps. You know, <laughs> it's about both. And so now we have a report from the Securities and Exchanges Commission in New York and some observations. During the deployment of the new code, however, one of Knight's technicians did not copy new code to one of the eight SMARS computer servers. Okay, let's just break this one down. They've got eight servers... They updated manually seven of them. Now, there's nothing wrong with people doing certain things if they recognize that they are people. Part of the human condition is the recognition we make mistakes. 
Okay, that, that's fine. I don't have a problem with people making mistakes. It's what they do after they make the mistakes. What are you going to do about the fact that you've realized you're human? And th- by the way, there is a... I'm, I, actually, that maybe comes a bit of a shock to some of you. Let me just rewind that. It is one of the great revelations of the 21st century. We have discovered that software developers are actually human beings. It was a mystery up until then. But now we know that people are prone to the same cognitive biases and failures as the rest of the human population. And if you don't think you are, and you say, oh, yeah, I've seen cognitive biases in other people, there's actually a cognitive bias for that. It's called the bias blind spot. It's, it is itself a, bi- a bias. So the point is, you, a little bit of humility is just like, okay, how can we do this? If you're going to do it manually, Knight did not have a second technician review this deployment. Ah, if you're going to do something manually, because there's a lot that you can do manually, but you combine it with the idea of another person. In other words, you try and enhance the group intelligence. You get somebody who maybe did not have too much wine and fondue last night, um, or something like that. And this is important. As somebody who flies a lot, um, I, one of the things you will, one of the things I always notice is there's a little bit where the captain says, um, uh, so cabin, uh, you know, there's a uh, cabin crew, um, doors to manual or doors to automatic and cross check, or arm doors or disarm doors and cross check. What does that mean? It means that the cabin crew will lock the doors because differential pressure is not something you really want to negotiate with during your flight, and then they will cross check. They will check their colleagues. This is a really simple thing. It turns out it's surprisingly successful. If you're going to do something manually, then, you know, this is the way to do it. If you're going to automate it, also do check that your automation is, you know, I've automated it, yeah, but did you check it? No, it's fine, it's automated. Uh, no, no, no. So uh, there's some interesting things here. Now, sometimes people approach it as a technical issue, but my feeling is it's actually more of a cultural issue. It actually tells you more about the company, the teams, and what is rewarded, what behaviors are rewarded, and what is supported. And we can see other exciting um, failures as a result of this. This is the um, uh, Schiaparelli lander. Uh, it was supposed to land... Oh, no, it did land on Mars's surface. Uh, October 2016. Um, and uh, it's a kind of preliminary news report in Gizmodo. Schiaparelli's internal measurement unit went about its business of calculating the lander's rotation rate. For some reason, the IMU calculated the saturation maximum period that persisted for one second longer than would normally be expected at this stage. So it thinks it's, hmm, well, when the IMU sent this bogus information to the craft's navigation system, it calculated a negative altitude. In other words, the probe thinks it's underground. Oops. And I know that there's a lot of European Space Agency activity in the Netherlands, but that's not the cause. Now, one of the great things is that you can go and look at these reports online. And I also love the language of, I love the language of space travel. We think, we think sometimes with software we've got euphemisms. No, these guys have got it. Schiaparelli anomaly inquiry. Anomaly. This is the phrase that is used. It was used um, uh, with, the, um, uh, with SpaceX and the uh, uh, little accidents they had the other week with uh, the uh, uh, capsule. It's referred to as an anomaly. If you watch The Martian, um, they refer to the explosion of um, uh, the uh, launch vehicle at one point in the film as an anomaly. Okay, I love this. Next time your servers crash and the whole world goes to hell and you lose $460 million, you say, we have experienced an anomaly. Okay, you just downgrade it. But... Here's, so I dug through it, and yeah, because of the error in the estimated attitude that occurred at parachute inflation, the GNC software projected the RDA range measurements with an erroneous off-vertical angle and deduced a negative altitude. Small note of maths, school maths, the cosine of angles greater than 90 degrees. That's negative. Just, 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 we'll just throw that one in there. Whoa, what's going on? It turns out, when you enter a planet's atmosphere, it's quite a... It's quite a turbulent experience. The craft wobbles. So you've got something basically that is tracking the wobble. One degree this way, one degree that way, one degree this way, one degree that way. Now you kind of hope that it would reset when it goes this, but actually it doesn't do, it, that's, this is the error. One degree this way, another degree that's two degrees, another degree that's three degrees, oops. This accumulates elegantly, so the craft eventually thinks, hey, I'm upside down, guess what? How much code was there to handle the possibility that this would happen. No code whatsoever, because 
this can't happen. Okay. This fateful miscalculation set, I love this. Again, if you are looking for vocabulary to use at work, this set off a cascade of despair. Well, we experienced a cascade of despair. That's brilliant. I love that. Such good use of language. Triggering the premature release of the parachute. In other words, basically the craft is going like, oh crap, I'm underground and I'm still fully dressed. Okay, throw off the parachute, the back shell, everything, fire, retros. This is all good, but it's, it's nearly 4K above the ground. And, you know, Mars's gravity is a bit lower than Earth's, but... Ha. 3,700 meters is still 3,700 meters. And indeed, the landing site was visible from orbit. Yeah, there is a nice little crater. Maybe we should call it Schiaparelli Crater, except there is already a Schiaparelli feature. So, this is the problem. Now, what is interesting here is that we have process for this. There's a paper a few years ago that was published. I, I often refer to it because it's, it's a paper that... It's one of those papers that has a really clear title. There is no ambiguity in this title. Simple testing can prevent most critical failures. Um, an analysis of production failures in distributed data-intensive systems. Okay, cool. Almost all catastrophic failures are the result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors explicitly singled in software. In other words, these are on the rainy day paths. It turns out the happy day paths are often better tested. They are better explored. They are better experienced. Users use them. But it's these little dark corners where what we've done, perhaps we've anticipated oh, this bad thing might happen, but we haven't tested it. Or we failed to anticipate this bad thing might happen. It's quite a difficult thing to do. But the point is, there's a blind spot there. And it's also not explored as, as well. And if our code is highly, highly coupled, it turns out it's quite difficult to test these scenarios. And, that be, and the minute anything is hard in a pressured environment, then that's one of the first things to go. Again, that's a standard human response. It's an, it's an understandable one. But it was interesting when they also did a further survey. A majority of the production failures over three quarters can be reproduced by a unit test. Now, that doesn't mean that they could have been caught in advance, necessarily. It simply says the possibility exists. But this goes back to the thing that I said before about people have failures, that's fine, up to a point, but there's the question of what do you do afterwards? Where does the learning come? You know, in other words, I saw this lovely uh, quote this morning. Um, Failure should not be considered, should be considered a bruise, not a tattoo. Okay? Uh, the point there is, you've got to learn from this stuff. You can respond. And this is, this is where, this is kind of our behavior here. And they, we do have a set of practices, and sometimes we, yeah, we, when push comes to shove, we may skip them. So, it's time for XKCD. Um, I could restructure the program's flow, or use one little go-to instead. And there are go-tos in, in all languages, you know? Uh, you know, sometimes, yeah, but we don't have the word go to. Yeah, actually, Java does have the word go to. It just says you can't use this. But hell, it's got label breaks. Awesome. I, honestly, I don't know what Jim Gosling was on then. Um, that was a really bad idea from the 1980s um, that a few languages explored, and it turns out that developers generally don't use this or should not use this. But um, it, we have lots of different ways of saying go to. Sometimes uh, it doesn't look direct. And there's a few functional programs that say, that say we don't have go to. No, you have monads which allow you to redefine the nature of the universe and to do this kind of stuff. Um, oh yeah, screw bad practice, how can it be? How bad can it be? Well, how bad can it be? It can be security level bad. There's an interesting thing here. Now, part of it, so there's a nice little bit there that the indentation, uh, so there's a number of things here. Is the real problem with this that it uses go to? Only partly. Is the real problem with this that there is copy and paste code? Again, partly. But it also, but the thing here is, this is one of the simplest things that is picked up by a linting tool. It tells me about the build process. They don't have any extra checking. They're running on low, effectively low warning levels. This also tells us about the tests. They don't have them. This is not tested. I mean, oh yeah, but that's low level C, you know. So this is what happens. You don't need Jurassic Park to recreate velociraptors. Oh no, you can just put a go-to in your code. But actually, there's a really interesting point here that was made by Mike Bland. Um, it's quite a long blog posting. It's hosted at Martin Fowler's site. And he talks about security. He talks about these errors, heart bleed error as well. But what is interesting here is he says, okay, these bugs are as instructive as they were devastating. They were rooted in the same programmer optimism. 
That's a key word. All programmers are optimists. You might not feel it, but you are, because otherwise, honestly, you wouldn't do this. <laughs> Overconfidence and haste that strike projects of all sizes and domains. You are not immune. It doesn't matter if it's a toy project or if it's something that is going to, uh, uh, is grid level uh, computing. So the, the point there, this happens. The question is, what do we do about it? And as I've said, simple checking and other checking um, helps. But what I find interesting is that in the article, and some people go, oh, well, that, that C code, that's difficult to unit test. What I, what I find interesting about that is that Mike Bland then goes through and shows you how to test it. When people say, oh, you can't do that, I love it when people say, and here's how you do it. And he shows you how to do it. This is all doable. Um, you know, I've seen and lived the benefits of unit testing, and this strongly imprinted experience compels me to reflect on how unit testing approaches can prevent defects as high impact and high profile as these SSL bugs. Now, what is also interesting is that we have a blind spot when we talk about development. And it is this notion, perhaps, that separates the idea of systems level view and responsibility. I am developing software as opposed to I am writing this code. I'm developing, I'm part of the development of a software system. <laughs> And the problem is that often people have a tendency to fall into line with job titles or explicit roles that they are given. And this is, uh, this job segregation can sometimes, it can sometimes be helpful or it's always done with a good intention, but sometimes it backfires because we then say, oh, the UX is not my problem. The configuration is not my problem. These are not part of my code. And when you ask somebody, so show me your code, if they're a Java developer, they will fire up the appropriate IDE, because Java developers don't believe in using editors, um, because it turns out that it's almost impossible to actually create a Java system without an editor. Uh, with an editor, and you, it turns out you need an environment to import the whole of the universe uh, to, for you. Um, and the names are so long that people are sitting there saying, what did you do before lunch? Well, I typed down a class name. So I do. You should use an IDE, because that, that'll, that'll fill out the 150 characters of that class name uh, for you. you know? So... There's, there's, a, there's an issue there. But what they will do is they will then show you the Java code. But there's no such thing as a Java system. I remember there was a, a fetish a few years ago when Sun was still Sun, uh, and they still shone, notionally, and they talked about 100% Java. There was never 100% Java. Most of it was XML and stuff. You know, if you, sh if you had a 100% Java system, the one thing you can guarantee is it would, it would contain no errors when it ran because it wouldn't run. You needed XML to glue it together. And XML is defined as a uh, human readable format. For some ver Somebody had some really strange ideas about human beings when they said that. Um, but the point is that all our systems, JSON, XML, all of these systems are built of code. And it's not just the thing that is the thing you regard as code, the thing you put first on your CV. It's all the other stuff, which includes configuration. So the reason I've got um, a Shoyer's uh, rocket. This is taking off um, from Vostochny um, in the far, far east of the Russian Federation. Um, it suffered a slight problem. This is 2017. Soyuz fails to deliver 19 satellites from Vostochny. 19. Wow. That's, that's, that's really going to blow, blow the commercials on that flight. And how did it do this? Well, it turns out the information is still pretty well, it's been confirmed. It is increasingly clear that all the hardware aboard the Frega uh, upper stage performed as planned. Okay, it's not a hardware fault. But almost unbelievably, the flight control system on the Frega did not have the correct settings for the mission. It was originally due to fly from uh, Baikonur, which is in Kazakhstan, and is kind of like the default launch location of Roscosmos. But, they, but there are two launch sites within the Russian Federation. Um, one is Plezetsk and the other is Vostochny. And Vostochny had just come online. These satellites were originally supposed to launch from Baikonur. And somebody went ahead and said, no, let's, let's use the new uh, facility, which is much, much further east. So what happens is the first two stages, all is good. And then the third stage gets there and it's like, okay, how are we doing? Oh, crap, I am so far off course. I'm like a whole Russia off course. I'm like 12 time zones off course. Shit, okay, I better get back on course. Anyway, that upper stage was seen re-entering the Earth's atmosphere somewhere around Iceland. It was observed by a British Airways flight. These are configuration errors. Oh, but that's not my code. It is. It's part, it is the configuration is code. It just happens to have a late binding time and is non-Turing complete. But that doesn't stop it being code. It affects the way your software runs. And there's a lovely term, actually, for this. LCEs, latent configuration errors. 
so many systems have LCEs. This is something you can test. Obviously, it's not an integration, it's not a unit level test, but it is still testable. And in many places in code, we find that the late binding is very, very late. The configuration could have been checked early on. You could have done a reality check. It's effectively, you'd say, the equivalent of a compilation stage. But often, it's just like, okay, we're going to need that value. Quick, get that value. Normally from a class that has a, has a singleton and has a name that's 150 characters long that involves the word singleton and factory and configuration and manager and a few other things. Just feel free to draw them in from the dictionary. But there are lots of these little errors that kind of cause problems. These little oversights that are significant. Um, in the UK, we had a kind of an interesting one um, leading up to Christmas last year. The uh, O2 mobile network went out. So this is the thing. When we talk about layered architectures, we are building on other people's works, but we're also, ta we're also building on their failures. And it, it, you know, suddenly your, your squat pyramid of layered power and reuse suddenly becomes a Jenga tower. And the whole thing falls apart. Turns out what this was, uh, eventually people traced this one to, um, they sort of said, actually, it's not O2, it's Ericsson. Actually, it turns out <laughs> Ericsson went a bit further. They said, yes, initial root cause analysis. The main issue was an expired certificate. An expired certificate. And then you, so, uh, an expired certificate, and you basically wipe out the mobile capacity. Um, uh, for a nation. It's just like, yeah, I mean, honestly, in Britain, we're already heading back to the Stone Age with Brexit. This takes us even further back. <laughs> so, but let's go further back. Let's have a bit of time travel. Go back to the 19th century, the birth of computing. Charles Babbage. One of my favorite quotes from Charles Babbage. On two occasions, I have been asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? I am not able to rightly apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. <laughs> Again, take that second paragraph and feel free, to feel free to use that in an email or a meeting. <laughs> when somebody asks something, it's just... And we have a really interesting source where this is played out on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the world of the spreadsheet. Spreadsheets allow us frictionless access to a functional programming environment that most developers don't use and do not consider to be programming, but it is programming. Oh, it is very much programming. People tend to forget that even the most elegantly crafted spreadsheet is a house of cards, ready to collapse at the first erroneous assumption. In August 1984, the Wall Street Journal reported... So here's an important thing I want to point out. The Stephen Levy article is from 1984. This is not... This, you know, the spreadsheet was still relatively young, but people thought it had come, actually already started changing the nature of business in a fundamental way and how people went about their work in terms of budgets and finances. It has already had a profound effect. And we'd already seen the consequences. In August 84, Wall Street Journal reported that a Texas-based oil and gas company had fired several executives after the firm lost millions of dollars in an acquisition due because of errors traced to a faulty financial analysis spreadsheet model. This is where it starts getting interesting. So that took down a, that affected a, a company, so it was business critical. This one turns out to have massive political consequences. Um, so 2010 paper, which I will just point out was not peer reviewed. Um, peer review may not be perfect, but it is better than imperfect. Yeah, it turns out that this is kind of one of those basic things. And if you have a model, and you used a spreadsheet to get it, that's fine. A spreadsheet is a prototyping tool. It is not the final product. Okay, remember the difference, okay? The problem with spreadsheets is that they hide their assumptions. They are surprisingly difficult to review. They are easy to create, but surprisingly difficult to um, uh, check. Because they're quite good at what they do. The problem is we make them do things that they're not necessarily designed for. Um, and we have a blind spot because we think it was so easy that therefore everything about them must be easy. And because it was so easy, it must be right. And that's a kind of a human bias. If it is easy, it must be right. If it is hard, it must be wrong. Yeah? So there's this idea here. Harvard University economists Karl Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff have acknowledged making a spreadsheet calculation mistake in a 2010 research paper, Growth in a Time of Debt, which is widely used uh, and widely cited to justify budget cutting. To be precise, this is the root of austerity economics that has crippled a number of countries' economies. They left off five rows of the spreadsheet that turned out to be kind of critical. How critical? 
The correction is substantial. The paper said that countries with a 90% debt, debt ratio see their economies shrink by 0.1%. Instead, it should have found that they grow by 2.2%. That is a substantial correction. That is getting it wrong big time. This could have been tested. It could have been peer-reviewed. It could be all kinds of stuff. We see this, you know, there's another brilliant one in terms of the um, climate denial brigade. This is, a, this is a, a brilliant one. Tim Lambert observed this one. Uh, Chris Rassix and Ross McKittrick. Uh, Ross McKittrick was recently replaced due to a little bit of, an, a, little bit of a scandal accepting money for something he wasn't supposed to accept for as, uh, 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 in an organization that uh, represents uh, climate deniers. Uh, present an example that purports to show that whether you use the arithmetic or some other mean can affect whether or not you find a global warming trend. And they did this with a spreadsheet. And they used this. This is how you do the arithmetic mean in Excel. That's fine. Now, what they're proposing, apparently, if you use different kinds of averages, you end up with different results. So you could use the median, you could use the mode, or you could use the root mean square. Let's be very clear. Here we are in the hub of physics. Let me be absolutely clear. Using the root mean square is known as, uh, in this context, is known as bad physics. It is incorrect. The RMS is not used for this. That is, thermodynamics is based on the mean in this case. Very simply, the arithmetic mean. And I've seen climate deniers wibble about this, and it's like, no. Honestly, you've got to change the laws of thermodynamics according to the 19th century. And that, we do not have a time machine for. So they use, they use the RMS. But it turns out Excel does not have an RMS function. So being non-programmers, this is how they programmed it. Well done them for remembering at least to adjust. For, for First of all, not using Fahrenheit. Yeah, you know, Americans use Fahrenheit. And you know, Brexit newspapers in Britain use Fahrenheit. Nobody else uses Fahrenheit. It's a nonsense. But well done then for using an adjustment to get to Kelvin. So they got that bit right. And obviously then you get the copy and paste effect. <laughs> yeah, I'm a developer, but I also have sufficient humility that I will, for you, just for you and nobody else, I will write VBA. <laughs> this is what they did. Okay, this is effectively what they did. When they calculated the trend, they found an overall cooling trend of 0.17 degrees Celsius per decade instead of a warming trend of 0.17. That's interesting. Uh, but Tim Lambert observed this. I looked at their graphs and something seemed wrong to me. Some stations had missing values. I contacted Tim Lambert. I got the original, I got the original spreadsheets. And I'm not a spreadsheet guy, but I opened it up. The first thing I saw was, that's funny, they've got missing values. It's really obvious. This is a new view. What are you going to do about those missing values? It turns out that average, as a built-in function does the right thing, kind of. What it does is it says that's a missing value and doesn't include it in the total that it divides by. So it kind of does the right thing. Although you loosen the statistical power here, what you should be doing is filling in that and substituting uh, an additional value there. But they didn't do that. They just let their calculation run. To understand what's going on, let's look at the code. We're doing this for each value. What's the cell value? It's space, which is zero, which pulls everything down quite a few degrees. This is testable. This is peer reviewable. Oh, yeah, this book wasn't peer reviewed either. So in other words, this is bad physics, bad stats, and bad code. It's a perfect storm. You know, here, at least we fixed the bad code. We've now just got bad stats and bad physics, OK? <laughs> So the point here, danger is not so much that incorrect figures can be fed into them, that as garbage can be embedded in the models themselves, and we're unaware of it. So what I'm going to close with, I want to give you a model classification that I was reminded of a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a wonderful paper by Maya Manny Lehman from 1980, Programs, Life Cycles, and Laws of Software Evolution. For whatever reason, I reread this in 2015, and I suddenly realized that the model that he presents, S P and E programs is directly relevant to the stuff that we do now. Directly relevant still 40 years later. What is an S program? An S program is a program whose function is formally defined by and derivable from a specification. S is for specification. Banking applications, these are S. Sorting algorithms, these are S. 
all of this stuff, the uh, RMS calculation, that is S. Most of the things that I have shown you are S. In other words, they are easy to unit test, they are easy to define. If I show you what the specification is, you can already start imagining the code and the tests. The tests are not a challenge. The real challenge is to come up with code that does that with suitable performance and tolerance. We'd like all our programs to be like this. We'd like all our code to be like this. Sometimes we make things too complex. We make things that should be S much larger and harder. But ultimately, there's a lot that can be done with this. OK, so let's, I'd like to say that's a solved problem, S for solved. But we know that that's not the case. But this at least tells us about one category. The next one is more interesting, because I kind of over, I, I, I read past it initially. P is for procedure. Despite the fact that the problem to be solved can be precisely defined, the acceptability of a solution is determined by the environment. In other words, your challenge is that the tests are not obvious. You have to define a concept of acceptability. Now, we actually find that this applies to a lot of our machine learning stuff. It turns out that the results are not a given. You, you've now got, you've got two problems. One is to create a thing that gives you the results that you want, and the second is to specify exactly what it is that you want. And it turns out that we are quite poor at this. We, we, you know, machine learning, we're going to give something training sets. It's like, yeah, machine learning sounds so grand. What, what are we doing? Matrix multiplication on a large scale. We are creating a correlational model. It's not a causal model, it's a correlational model. So therefore, we're going to end up with the garbage in, garbage out, but also bias in, bias out. It turns out that there are far too many um, cases of hidden bias in the statistics that are uh, in the uh, data that is used. That is a blind spot, because what we're doing is we're, we are defining both the outcome and the way that we're going to achieve that outcome. Whereas with S, the outcome is kind of already given. Whether it's by the rules of banking, the rules of accounting, the rules of physics, whatever, there's this idea that we can, we've already got a given. But here, what is an acceptable solution? That's actually quite a hard problem to, speci uh, to specify. But if you treat the problem as an S problem, you'll never notice that you've got a problem here. So the first thing is, is this P or S? Then it gets interesting. E. E is where the system you have created is now part of the world. And what I mean by that, societal activities. The program has become a part of the world it models. It is embedded in it. It creates a feedback cycle. The example that Maya Lehman gives is a relatively simple one. Um, an air traffic control system. The output of the air traffic control system, we have aircraft in the sky. Air traffic controller looks at the software, looks at the output and goes, ah, I'm going to tell this plane to do this route based on the data that I'm getting. I'm going to tell the plane, I'm going to communicate with the craft to do that. The pilot will enact that, and then I'm going to see that effect on my machine. So it's a nice, simple, you can draw it on a diagram type thing. And you can suddenly see, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it changes the world that it's in. It turns out a lot of our software, that was 1980. Here in 2019, it turns out that lots of our software looks like this. It changes the world that it is in. And one of my favorite illustrations of this, 2011. This is a, sta apparently this is a standard book, The Making of a Fly, The Genetics of Animal Design. And I, I ran a workshop recently where I used this as an example, and one of the, uh, one of the people on the workshop said, oh, actually, yes, I, uh, I, I've got a PhD in genetics, and yes, this is a standard work. But he said, but honestly, I think I'd pay the used price of $35 than hit the two million mark. I mean, I'm sure it's a good book, but it's not that good. <laughs> anyway, the price changed on a daily basis. Daily basis. Guy wrote this blog, then did appropriate spreadsheet analysis. Basically, this is Amazon as a marketplace, not Amazon as a vendor. Okay, there are two players in the game for this book: Profnath and Bordy Book. And if you look at the ratio, they on a day-to-day -day basis. It's surprisingly constant. And what is interesting here is you can actually tell what each system is doing. Profnath has the book. And they will undercut. Their, their strategy is to undercut the lowest other price at 0.9983. We find the lowest other price, and we will be the cheapest in the market, just by undercutting it by a few pennies. Board ebook does not have the book. Their strategy is, you pay us, we buy the book, we get a 27% cut, and pass it on. Awesome. Both of these systems, individually, are correct. Within their own S world. 
Sadly, that's not the world that they are deployed in. And this is a problem, because we often think when we are in front of our screens, we reduce things to these, you know, we say, oh, yes, it is testable, it is tractable, but actually, yeah, you put these two together and you can get a bizarre feedback effect. <laughs> Got to 23 million before they pulled the plug. And anyway, Amazon now have stuff that checks against this. And you might say, well, that's a solved problem, is it? Now, you may have noticed we've been running a rather large-scale and fascinating social experiment in the UK the last few years. Personally, I think it would be fair to say it's not going well. Um, but let us learn some lessons. This is really interesting. The pound is not in a good shape. And even that does not explain this behavior. One of the things, in 2016, the Conservatives, the Conservative Party had a... Um, uh, had a conference, and what was noticeable is if you watch the conference speeches, I chose not to watch the conference speeches because I wanted to keep my heart rate something somewhere tolerable. If you watch the conference speeches and then looked at the pound, the pound, after every speech, went down. And you, did, you honestly said, honestly, what the, the thing that the Conservative Party could do best, the government could do best for the country at this point is shut up. Because <laughs> every time they open their mouth, the pound goes down. But that's on a time scale of hours and days. This is quite unusual. This is a flash crash. It, it dropped 10% in value in a very short space of time. Humans can't do this. This is machines. This is, this is high-speed algorithmic trading. This is exactly the Amazon problem, but done at high speed. And this is the great thing about computers. If you can do something, if you can do something good, this is great. But if you get it wrong, you can really screw things up at high speed. Far faster than a human being can. It amplifies, and this is the point. Um, Earl Wiener, who's an expert in um, uh, safety critical and aviation software, went out, digital devices tune out small errors while creating opportunities for large errors. And this is kind of an interesting one. And there's a kind of whole question here of social responsibility that we need to be perhaps a little more aware of. So that's meaningful. It's also the last slide. So here's the interesting thing. People use this phrase, they talk about full stack development. It's not a phrase I'm particularly fond of, and whenever anybody says they're a full stack developer, I've figured out it just means they do JavaScript and touch a database. That, that, you know, apparently that's the full stack. If you ask them for, okay, so what's your kernel level experience, they kind of look at you blankly. The full stack is really deep, but even depth, this is part of the point, that's looking down. We actually need to look up as well, because whenever we create a piece of software, it probably has an implied context. There is nothing wrong with a piece of code that does not account for edge cases if you're very clear and you understand exactly where it's going to go. But if you find that it has a life of its own and gets used in another environment... So I've been... I was very surprised at a number of companies... And this is my wake-up call. A number of companies, I would give them demo code. Oh, this is how you solve this. i give them demo code. Then a couple of years later, I'd go back and I'd be doing a code review and go, hey, this code is hauntingly familiar. It looks unlike the code around it. That's because it's my code. You do know, guys, you know this was demo code. Oh, yeah, but it's better than the stuff we had. Or, you know, well, you'd already done it. And, you know, because it's you, it's probably right. It's just like, oh, faith-based programming. Don't do that. You know, I am human. I make mistakes. And I also probably simplified certain things. And maybe you got lucky, but luck is not a strategy. Okay? And so there's that notion. Once you need, we need to be very careful about understanding that context. We need to look at the world outside and figure out where is that little sorting algorithm going to be used? Where is this going to be used? Do we understand the context? Do we need to escalate the context? Do we need to put boundaries? Do we need to advertise this? Do we need to bulletproof this? Do we need to test? All of these are questions. I can't give you the answers. That is for you to do. Thank you very much.